Also here I would like to first uh, mention this was a group effort, so it's also uh, uh, Zoriana, Romanchuk, Orisia Yaschun, Linda of course, and uh, a bunch of other colleagues from uh, Denmark, Wales helped with this research. So it's not just me, but I worked on the train and I had to uh, <laughs> prioritize other things. Uh, so I will, uh, Linda has already shown why we did this, uh, so what the purpose was, but I want to focus on this grassland aspect, or let's say the livestock mapping aspect. Um, and I will show today what we did and why this is important and how uh, yeah, scientists can benefit from this. Uh, and I will also mention some uh, main concepts or, or uh, uh, yeah, ob objectives of our research. Uh, uh, one of, and, and the main one is basically this one, that not all livestock grazes, and you will see what I mean with this. So uh, this study started already last year when we started collecting, well, started pretty boring, we started collecting subnational data on um, livestock, on grazing livestock in Europe, so sheep, goats, and uh, cattle. I will show later why this was important, because currently we have Eurostat data, we have some subnational data, but it's pretty coarse, and we wanted to go as local as possible. And we didn't stop there, we were also interested in what these livestock, well, how do they look like? Uh, and we collected data on grazing, so well, here we mean actually grazing outdoors. Countries do report on this, but very unsystematically, or we have to dig into other sources. For example, for Italy we found we had to go through veterinary reports, animal welfare reports and so on. And uh, so in some countries you can see this data pretty detailed. You know, you can see it uh, in France, Italy, Portugal has municipal data. Uh, but in some countries it's just one uh, national number or share. So you can already see these differences here. But you can already see that, you know, uh, 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 there's huge differences both between countries in Europe, regions in Europe, let's say West and East, or Atlantic versus Mediterranean. Uh, and even within the same bioclimatic region, let's say continental Europe, central Europe, we see huge differences. And a lot of grazing in South Tyrol, uh, here in the Czech Republic, and then very few grazing, for example, in Lower Austria, where we are now. Uh, so this already shows that we can expect different, uh, let's say, this is for cattle, by the way, that we can expect, expect different livestock systems. So yeah, big differences in Europe, in, in, in countries, and even within countries. Uh, and some of these countries are huge livestock producers, Italy, Spain, uh, right? Uh, and one example is, for example, why this is so important, uh, because feed can come sometimes from places far away. So I found some data that in Poland, 20% of feed for cattle comes from Brazil. So you can mean, th th this means two things, right? That first, ecosystem impacts are elsewhere, and also that e ecosystem impacts on grasslands in Poland are actually lower, because they get a large amount of feed from places far away. So pressures on grasslands are different than just uh, LSU per hectare, so livestock unit. So what we did, uh, of course, we're mappers. We had to use remote sensing data or, remote or data derived from remote sensing products. And first we developed a grazing mask using a green land cover. We did a huge survey that, last, that went on for four years. So our colleagues from YASA, European Environment Agency, uh, uh, pastoralist uh, societies, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and they identified which land cover types are grazed and to what extent. So they are not, these, you can see that there's huge differences. So in some countries, these were just, uh, let's say, permanent grasslands or pastures. In other countries, these were also uh, herbaceous, uh, uh, sorry, uh, heterogeneous agricultural areas, even cropland areas, uh, arable lands, and so on. Um, and then we used Lucas data because we needed some in situ data on grazing, because Lucas reports on signs of grazing. doesn't necessarily report grazing, but signs of grazing. So this could be an animal present uh, on the field or uh, infrastructure, like a fence or water through. And we use this as our uh, sample for grazing. So you can see already here we get an indication as well that, uh, again, of the diversity in Europe, right? In Europe we see that there's much more grazing happening here than, than let's say, in Central Europe. And even within countries we see much more grazing happening here then in other parts of Spain or in France, we have this blind spot of grazing. And in, in Italy, you know, the, one of the countries with best cheese and dairy products, we see very few grazing in areas with extremely high cattle numbers. So this was our in situ data, and then we matched this with a set of ev environmental uh, and socioeconomic characteristics, such as uh, uh, soil clay, s soil sand, uh, drainage class, terrain, uh, climatic uh, characteristics also distance to roads and so on. Uh, so we use this as our predictors. And we, we operate it within different bioclimatic zones. So uh, we use this environmental strata by Metzger, 
so these are the zones that we worked on. Uh, so you can see uh, that, uh, uh, so we basically developed machine learning models in each of these areas. So we had one for Atlantic area, for Lusitanian, uh, Continental, Pannonian, and so on. Because we wanted to capture the, these different, you know, bioclimatic uh, 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 characteristics. Uh, so our model, uh, I'll show later the, the result. Uh, you can see that we have a lot of d d big differences in the sample points um, uh, between different regions. So we have a lot of uh, sample points in the uh, uh, Atlantic zone, for example, 18,000, 13,000 in uh, the Mediterranean, and not so much in Alpine South, actually. So these are, this is our model fit, also ranges that we, we see quite large differences between different regions. So very, well, very low, rather low in the Atlantic part and uh, rather high in the Mediterranean mountains. The reason is not necessarily that our model would perform worse, but there's, there, there, there's no clear difference between grazed and non-grazed areas in Atlantic Europe. So there must be some other decision behind, uh, or some other reason behind uh, grazing or non-grazing, uh, and not necessarily uh, something we can explain spatially. Maybe it's some economic reason or f f that we cannot capture. And this also shows that our regional approach, you know, makes sense because we see very different variables contributing. These are the top five variables to grazing. So uh, silt content in Alpine South and, Alp uh, and farmers age in the Pannonian region, for example, right? So our result was then the pr probability map for grazing. So this is stitched together, mosaic uh, from different uh, environmental zones. So we see very few, very low probabilities in uh, the Po Valley, so Northern Italy. Uh, we see uh, very high in Ireland. And then using the data of grazing that I have sh sh shown you before, uh, no, sorry, the expert-derived uh, expert shares of areas that are grazed, we developed a binary grazing, non-grazing map. So orange is grazed, sorry about that. Maybe it should be reverse. So everything that's orange is grazed by using this probability map and the expert share. So we also wanted to apply this probabilistic approach. So if someone has better data, comes up with better data, we can very quickly redo this map, or if we get more local data on grazing. Uh, and we can see already here, again, these large differences in, in different parts of Europe. Which bring, and then we had to allocate livestock. So we went, uh, this is the livestock data I mentioned. So we collected data from 63, 73,000 local administrative units from all around Europe. These are either municipalities, uh, let's say in France, I Italy, Slovenia, Austria, we have da data from municipalities. In other countries, we have data from, uh, in, in Spain, we have from other administrative units, freguesias, which are not, uh, not freguesias, what are they? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's not municipality, but it's not region. Uh, and then uh, it wards in the UK. Uh, uh, in other, some countries like Germany, uh, we use not free data, so Kreise. So you can see a lot of differences in Europe between data availability. This was a very time-consuming process. You know, you, we had to do it in different languages because Google Translate doesn't really work well uh, and in statistical portals uh, and so on. Sometimes the data was, we came across it by accident even and so on. Uh, but you can see this is where we, uh, the, that we have very detailed data where our livestock are. By comparison to Aerostat, Aerostat provides numbers for 325 units. So graphically, this looks like this. So red are national data. Black are nuts too, what Eurostat provides, and all gray are our units. So look at France, the level of detail we provide now, or, or Ireland, or uh, I think Ireland is even parish, even more detailed than municipality. And in Germany, you know, shame on you, <laughs> uh, we don't have such good data there. So this is our final result. We made a livestock density map, but not just a density of livestock, but we were even able to split it in semi-natural grazing, uh, cattle that are grazing, so outdoors, or that are not grazing. They're in zero grazing systems. North Italy is one of these prime examples. Cattle are inside all the time, uh, even, uh, you know, uh, even if they're fed grasslands from the nearby areas, they're inside. The Netherlands are an interesting example. There's a clear divide between west and east. Uh, fr France very, uh, and Spain are also very diverse. You know, we have basically all different systems in these countries. Uh, and then, yeah, maybe Central Europe is more homogeneous, let's say. But there's a clear divide in the European Union, so more grazing in humid Atlantic areas, low-density grazing in Mediterranean, also understandable, you know, there's less biomass or more uh, land degradation if there's grazing. Uh, so, but very high-density zero grazing in the Mediterranean region, also in Catalonia, for example. 
And Central Eastern Europe hosts both. So it has a high share of semi-natural areas and then a high share of zero grazing systems. So this is what you know, we were able to do. And you can imagine that the consequences for environment, uh, emissions, animal welfare are very different in these three systems. You know. Uh, this is just a summary of this data. So uh, countries sorted out based on uh, both the type of grazing. So green numbers are grazing, so outdoor. And then we can see the densities. And I'll come back to this later because in some countries we see most cattle being in areas with very high densities, you know, like Sweden, Estonia, Luxembourg, Belgium, Finland, also the Netherlands. Um, and the EU average is somewhere f half, which is yeah, actually pretty interesting. <laughs> within the, uh, that roughly 50% grace, with the rest being indoors. But yeah, a lot of diversity, even between different member states. You know, it's very difficult to say that some are that more similar. So the second like, message is the presence of trees and shrubs that not exclude livestock. And this is often done in such mapping uh, 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 exercises, that livestock is just allocated on areas where there's open landscapes. So what I did is, uh, still, this is still unpublished, so the previous one will be published soon, so I invite you to, to read this paper. Uh, but here what I did is I basically looked at uh, different landscapes in Europe, uh, basically used our cattle density map and high resolution tree cover data, and I aggregated it in a one kilometer landscape to try to capture the landscape context, and wanted to see, again, per environmental zone, uh, if we have different landscapes. So this circle are exemplary landscapes that I will show later. But basically, there's five quantiles in each zone, each environmental region, in terms of tree cover. Red is lowest tree cover, blue is highest tree cover. Why well, we did this? Because I wanted to show that solutions to improve the sustainability of grazing, let's say by introducing landscape elements or increasing tree cover, they do not have to come from places far away, but even within the same landscape. So I come from Slovenia, so I just took five landscapes from Slovenia that have, are very close, 10 kilometers apart, but have very different tree cover in pastoral landscapes. You know, open, some woody elements, and then completely forested, well, not completely. We see the same in the Netherlands, in the Atlantic zone, continental Pannonian, and you can see that there's also difference between different environmental zones, right? Even the most dense area in the Atlantic is uh, maybe the third, would be a third quantile in another uh, zone. So the same is then in the boreal region, Lusitania and Mediterranean, un unsurprisingly, has the lowest tree cover, right? Uh, because of, of climatic conditions. Uh, and the interesting here is that, of course, we can see that the tree cover obviously is increasing per quantile. So each column means a quantile. But livestock density in the same quantiles is also decreasing. So there is a relation between a more forested, well, not really forested, a landscape with more tree cover or landscape elements and uh, livestock density. Not necessarily so. So in the Pannonian zone, we didn't observe this. Oh, the, the orange ones are zero grazing systems and the green ones are grazing systems. So we, you can see that we have uh, generally higher densities in uh, grazing systems than, than zero grazing. But that in some zones, there's virtually no difference in cattle density, if, even if we have more landscape elements, which is a good, good news, right? Oh, sorry. So then another message is that productivity of grasslands limits the type of livestock present. So we wanted to see, in our assignment, we didn't use any grassland productivity measure, but I, I was really interested to do this, so I used this rather old data on, uh, on, um, uh, by thought on grassland productivity, uh, but good for this purpose. I think it represents roughly to the 2010 uh, year. Um, and I just l made these binary uh, maps, uh, sorry, multivariate maps, uh, to, to see where we have high grassland productivity and where we have high cattle density. So everything brown is where you know, we have, uh, sorry, uh, green is where we have both high densities and high grassland productivity. And you can see some areas like the Netherlands, Ireland, uh, Atlantic France that can also explain such densities. And then we have also areas where this is not the case, like in the UK, or Eastern France. And this could be areas where we could also expect, uh, let's say, overgrazing. This shows also that we need better data. And one way would be dry matter productivity. It's something we discussed with Leandro because uh, you know, it's a proxy of how much biomass is available because you generally do not transport grass biomass over long distances for cattle or, or other ruminants. But it could also show here that it's very difficult. You know, Linda showed you this nice decision tree that, we d that took very long to develop. But this map also shows that 
in different contexts, we would need different decision trees, right? So here, even over two livestock units per hectare is maybe fine. And here, you know, even one may be too much. Uh, or, or we can expect depletion, or we might need to uh, provide a lot of inputs, a lot of fertilizer, nutrients, and so on. So this is something I think it's a good way forward, so to uh, add something on productivity. We did use climate, soil, and so on, but grass and productivity, I think, is something that could benefit, uh, that could improve our approach a lot. And then some comparison uh, sort of confirmed this. So we can see that uh, most of, uh, if we look at high productivity grasslands, they have the highest share of moderate, high, and very high density. And if you look then reversely in density systems, we can also see that high and very high density systems, they mostly have uh, high, very high and high productivity grasslands. So it confirms our map as well, I would say. Um, and then if we look at these two, this, this, is, uh, uh, this is relative and this is absolute numbers. So it shows that we still have most of our areas are low density areas. In terms of area, this is not in terms of livestock. Uh, and that basically, uh, when you look at productivity, we see that even you know, in terms of productivity, we still have a lot of areas with low densities, rather low densities. So, uh, you have already seen semi-natural often, uh, this term, I mentioned it a lot, and uh, these landscapes are often ignored in all these large-scale models, large-scale mapping approaches, and so on. Uh, and if we look at traditionally what, when we talk about livestock grazing or livestock uh, systems, uh, let's say all econometric models, agricultural models, land use models, uh, I showed three different landscapes from Europe. So this is from where I come from, this is, is from Spain, the Hesa, and this is Flevoland in the Netherlands, uh, close to where Tom is living. And usually these models only consider this type of system. So an open landscape with a lot of cattle uh, that are also easier to map, and they ignore these two. Uh, but a lot of livestock is present in these areas. So this is again green land cover. So we can see that these traditional approaches focus on pasture, the pasture class, and they ignore this. Th there's even a class called natural grassland, implying that there is no you know, human activity there. Uh, and then there's moors and heatlands, chlorophyll vegetation, traditional woodland scrub, right? And what we did is, again, we sat down with experts, we used Lucas data, we did the same thing that I showed you before, machine learning and so on. Um, and we identified that these are all semi-natural areas in Europe, so the mask I showed you before, and 27% of them are grazed. So perhaps we should really, you know, think the term natural grassland. These are maybe uh, close to nature grassland or something like this, because a lot of them are grazed, but on very low densities. The densities are incomparable to the systems that I have shown you before. You know, sometimes it's zero one livestock unit, or sometimes only grazed with uh, sheep and goat, of course, in the Mediterranean Europe, for example, right? Like in Greece and Italy. Uh, and why this is important, so this is a screenshot from the FAO uh, data, from the FAO livestock map. Uh, so all these white spots, they say no grazing. So the photo I showed you before from Slovenia, it's from here. This says no grazing. All northern Italy, no grazing. All alpine areas, no grazing. If it's a protected area, no grazing. And in reality, there is grazing, sometimes even at high densities, usually lower densities. Uh, even if you go to the supermarket now here in uh, Luxembourg, you can buy milk that says milk from this natural park. But you know this map says no, no, no grazing there. But you pay a bonus for this milk, right? <laughs> uh, because cows eat all the herbs there. Uh, so this already shows that if we, you know, if we use this in our, uh, some macro model, perhaps it's fine. But if you use it in a biodiversity model or nutrient uh, to, to study nutrients, our models would say, oh, water, you know, w waters are clean here. There's no nutrients. Uh, there's no impact on uh, uh, grassland ecosystem because of grazing and so on. But it's also re reverse, right? Often these landscapes are maintained because of grazing. And looking at products like this, we cannot really be sure where we do maintain them successfully or not with grazing. Otherwise, they can be overgrown and become forests, which is also bad for grassland biodiversity, right? So uh, if you just take this approach of ours and then look at numbers, we can see that for cattle, sheep, and goats, we sometimes get very high numbers of animals grazing in the same natural systems. So in Austria, 25% of cattle is grazing you know, in these areas that are considered as non-grazed in most mapping approaches. And we can see that 91% and 100% of sheep and goat in Norway, for example, are grazing in such areas, uh, uh, um, uh, very high also in Denmark, although the, you know, the total numbers are low and so on. So we can see that 
by ignoring it, we can ignore very large number of animals. You know? And even if we would say this is a small share in Spain is, I don't know, 7% in France of cattle grazing, this is still, I don't know, a million of cows. So we cannot ignore it, right? Uh, so I want to show some maybe other ideas. Maybe some of you will, will uh, you know, uh, I see a lot of smart people in the audience. Maybe you can, we can, you can use them other ways forward to improve mapping of livestock presence or grassland pressure in something we're working on. So uh, I have shown you some maps, but we often ignore uh, uh, sources of feed. So this is not necessarily spatial or derived from remote sensing, but this is already quite old study, but there's very bad data on f sources of feed for ruminant livestock or also other livestock. Dark green is the grass component. So we can see that in many areas, Sweden, for example, where I, had, where I have shown you extremely high shares, I think 90% of cattle grazing in high densities, in reality, only 25, you know, 20 percent of the feed comes from grass. The rest is all from silage maize, uh, silage hay, uh, even cereal grains, and protein-rich, so soybean. So this means that what is on our map is still insufficient to assess what, means, what this means for like, grassland resources, grassland biodiversity, because it could actually be that these animals are just enjoying the outdoor air, fresh air. In reality, they get most of their feed from other places. In some countries, even places far away. So uh, uh, the Netherlands, you can see a quite big component uh, from soy here. Uh, and uh, then other cattle, uh, we, we see sometimes a completely different profile, right? But the data on this is very poor, not systematically collected. It's not subnational. And even if you talk to modelers, what I spoke a lot uh, to in the Lamasus project, usually they ap apply one, est uh, one number for the whole of the EU. But you can see, or any other world region, but you can see that there's huge differences. And this could improve our map a lot. You know, if we would say, yes, so many animals are outside in Sweden, but so many animals get their feed from, I don't know, in Belgium, by a byproduct from the beer brewing uh, industry. You know, this is already changes the picture a lot. Then other sources to map. We're all interested in mapping, uh, 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 mapping things in innovative ways. And uh, we had nice discussions with Leandro and his and other Brazilian colleagues that, you know, using Google Street View, for example, we can identify this. So maybe there, the statistics indicate no cattle in this area, in this municipality, because it's all mown and then sent 200 meters away to the next municipality. We have seen these local artifacts a lot where we see extremely low densities in one municipality in the Netherlands, extremely high densities in another municipality in the Netherlands. And it's because of this, you know, maybe after this row, there's already a new municipality. And we cannot really see this from space. We can now with high resolution imagery. And also Lucas is just present at one point of the time. And the same with Google, for example, Google Street View. But, uh, you know, this is one way how to map it. And sometimes we can see it very well from space. You know, these are the plastic hay bales. This is from where I come from, so that's why I knew where to find it. <laughs> but you can see, you know, they store them below trees sometimes, and they're pretty well seen. And this indicates a huge farm. And indeed, there's like a, cow, a farm with far 400 livestock units right there. So this could be a proxy to map these, I don't know, mega stables or something like this, right? And to identify localized nitrogen polluters, because this is a lot of feed. Sometimes it looks like this, you know, just what is left on the field. But you need to be lucky to find that the satellite image was taken exactly at the time. Because here we just see it's mown, and here we still see it drying on the field, right? Uh, one way to, you know, get this right is to look at mowing cutting data. And this is what Linda already mentioned. We tested quite some data. We're now waiting for some better data or at least systematic data because this is... Uh, there are three different products for Germany that do not really agree. Uh, there's uh, one product for the Netherlands. Uh, then there's different local scale studies that did this. But in reality, you know, we can see pretty well if there's mowing or no mowing uh, and how much mowing events there are because there's a clear sign, you know, there's a, a, a when uh, biomass was removed. This could also be used in theory for identifying grazing, because with grazing, this could be a slower signal, not necessarily so steep or so sudden, although it could also be with high numbers, right? But this is something that we hope to get. And our first aim, and I think Linda can confirm this, was that we would first take the mowing data, and what is not mown, we would consider being grazed. In reality, we didn't get the mowing data, so now we have an area that's not grazed. And because we have a lot of livestock, we assume that there's a lot of mowing. So, and hopefully in the future, we get this better. And we can see that there are some, sometimes there's a bit noise, but sometimes not. I think with only moan and not moan, we see some 
I think it looks quite promising. And Bavaria, indeed, despite having all these nice Alps, uh, has very low share of animals grazing. But with mo up to two times a year, we see a lot of, you know, it's all around the place. And so be because this could be mown or grazed, or grazed for other purposes, let's say uh, next to highways or railroads. So I think this is very promising data, but we still need to work on it. Um, so this is the Dutch data. We can see, uh, so I lived close to, uh, so this is where I lived before, so that's why I know it. <laughs> uh, but we can see, you can see that you can even recognize the fields. You know, this field is uh, uh, mown four times a year, this field only three times, and this field is not mown. The problem is that it's not the same each year. You know, one year this is maybe mown, the next year is not mown and it's grazed, so the, the land gets some fertilizer, manure, whatever. So again, we would need annual data on this. It's very difficult to have a classification based on one year alone. It also depends on the climatic conditions, if it was a dry year, a wet year, and so on, right? And this is from Spain, where we can also see uh, even parcels, basically. You know, this parcel is uh, not, gray, uh, not mown, this parcel is heavily mown. So we can get clear signals, but this is quite data pro processing intensive and usually very local and difficult to transfer across Europe, let alone other parts of the world. So yeah, I think guiding models to include regional characteristics can improve the results. This is what we, we did. Even within Europe, we split it into different regions. Estimating the share of livestock linked to grasslands is important, but you know, can lead to weird results in some region because of this additional feed and so on, and because the data is not the best still, statistical data, I mean. And I think including other ways of how we can we use grasslands beyond direct grazing is important. So uh, yeah, again, thank you to all my collaborators, so Linda, Zuriana, uh, uh, Orisia, and the rest, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. And the data is, of course, publicly available on Zenodo, so please. Use it and uh, let us know where we are wrong. 